Okay. Do I have emotion to accept the meeting minutes, approve the minutes of um, November 1st, 2023? I'll move. Thank you. A second? I'll second. Thank you, Rich. All in favor? All set, Bonnie? Yep. And we're going to move the order of the agenda with the chair report coming later. And the next item on the agenda is incorporating native shrubs, shrubs into the setback mix. I and, take attendance. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Rich Persolity. He is driving, but here. Susan? Here. Molly? Here. Jennifer? Here. David? Here. Richard Parrish? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I need a cheat sheet. <laughs> I, I get thinking about other stuff. You're doing great. Oh, thanks. All right, incorporating native shrubs into the setback mix. Um, David's brought this up and it's interesting. And then Kent sent some information around on some projects that incorporate different types of plant material. We've been focused on shade trees as our name used to be shade tree commission. And um, we're having a conversation about it, about diversity and um, ways to get people to plant more woody, woody material. David, do you want to add more? Cause you can, you've been. Um, yeah. So, well, it. so um, I think Jordan, uh, Jordan and I chatted briefly and he was go going to look at a list of uh understory trees and shrubs and uh, jen i believe you you you, uh, you were going to look at the list also but he, he's he's not here but i think he was prepared to actually talk about the pros and cons of 10 or so species um so i don't know how to proceed given the, that he's not here but sue i think you're also referring to the this sort of overlap between the Miyawaki forest concept, which is very dense, sort of random plantings and some of these understory trees. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought they were kind of um, related to one another, the planting of different sizes of of trees, but the, you're really talking just about incorporating witch hazel and some other species into the what the city purchases is that do i understand yeah correctly? so what what the, so what the city offers um to residents willing to host a setback tree so they could choose by burnham's or um small dogwoods uh things like that as part of the mix and you're keeping the focus on um all natives for that particular situation. Yeah, all native, na native shrubs, right. And would these be treated similarly to uh, how setback trees are done now? You know, with a with a homeowner. Yeah, I would. Yes, I think almost exactly as they're treated now. I mean, one idea, I guess, is to run a sort of a trial program come spring and see if the demand is there for these these shrubs and and understory trees i know my neighbors who have shrubs are um there's a lot of pruning involved and of course they're not as tall mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um training and pruning i don't know if anybody can talk to speak to that about the the care for them how it would be similar or different from what we're doing now. Yeah, I think smaller, the smaller shrubs or trees, I guess, might require more attention than the 
the tall trees that we're putting in now. Um, you know, and I guess like setbacks, if these are treated as setbacks with agreements, you know, the city tends them for the first couple years, right. and then the homeowner adopts it thereafter. Um, so it's all doable, but yeah. Yes, Molly. Um, can you remind me what your thoughts are on why we should do this? Well, I think that uh, a lot of residents are concerned about uh, potential solar, like future solar uh, panel installations, and worry that hosting a traditional setback tree would sooner or later interfere with their ability to harvest solar power. And Rich, Rich has noticed that this just anecdotally in talking to people. I guess my question is whether the benefits of having shrubs versus big trees are worth it, are worth it in terms of something that we should get involved with. Um, both the expense of buying the shrubs and then the, the maintenance and pruning of them, given that they don't really provide, they, they provide, they could be wildlife food, that could be one benefit and their aesthetic, but they don't provide the carbon sequestration or the shade you know, and, and heat island uh, amelioration functions that a big tree would. So I'm a little bit dubious personally myself. Well, I would say they provide most of the benefits of a, of a big tree. Um, in fact, all, almost every benefit except for shade itself. Well, they're just so much smaller, like like a witch hazel compared to a red oak. You know, it's just the amount of biomass that it contains. It's just not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to provide the shade or, you know, doesn't spread out that way. And it doesn't have the volume to sequester and hold on to carbon in amounts that a tree would. Right. Um, I think, um, one thing I would say is that, uh, you know, shrub, the title shrub or tree is kind of um, not arbitrary, but there's no like, there's no right line, right? What language would you use as a professional, Jen? Well, definitely a shrub. But, you know, I can tell you when I taught at a community college, there was certain certain plants we taught in the tree class that I could have probably taught in the shrubs class, like arborvitae, for example, but that was in the tree class. And then I taught some that could have been in the, I taught shrubs and it could have been in tree class. Like there's this, uh, oh, Oh shoot! Now I can I can only remember the scientific name sometimes. That's okay, throw it out. It's, it's this viburnum. Um, viburnum layers like viburnum dilatatum and viburnum. Um, oh, it's a well, I think double file is the nanny berry viburnum. Yeah, somewhat yeah. invasive viburnum. Yeah, nanny berry viburnum. That's the one. Oh, nanny berry uh, viburnum. Yeah, that's a, a in that I taught that, but it is. You no, know, it's like a small tree. It's like a as big of as dogwood would get, or you know. So I guess um, I definitely would only think about them for set for setbacks for sure. But um, yeah, I think as a commission, we have to wrestle with: Are we interested in getting trees planted where somebody would be skittish to put a big, big tree in? Like, certainly we could try to convince them, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's kind of a moral or ethical, like, what do we, you know, what, what's our like, purpose? Yeah, kind of like, what do we, um, yeah, because there are all kinds of, and if we only have to prune them for two years, we can, you know, try to limb them up and then, you know, see what happens. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I guess yeah, so. So it's two years. That's that's our commitment, Rich. As I understand it, yeah. Okay. 
I mean, there's a lot of great puppeteers. Some of them you may have a little hard time finding, but um, it's possible, you know. I guess I'm inclined to try to promote the the, the importance of large shade trees because of the cooling benefits that come with them and that it has been the challenge always you know, we have the arbor day um a lot of people come and say i want lilacs and crab apples and these ornamental small plants versus the larger ones that you know if you have people especially if we want to get people out of their cars and out of you know walking biking and these hot spots we've got around um i guess i see our biggest priority is getting big trees in private property <laughs> in the setbacks for the mm -hmm. setbacks to cool people when they're walking um but planting stuff's good i mean all planting stuff is it's always good excuse um, me so so it's rich I, oh hi hey there i'm just getting settled i just landed um i just wanted to just mention that um i believe that the setback shrubs if we're going to do this are going to the same uh regulations or the same rules mgl 87 apply so they would be considered public public shrubs or a public planting in perpetuity so in perpetuity not, not just yeah two year like are we responsible for maintaining them for more than two years well if, if we apply the same matrices that uh, we've been instructed to apply for setback trees the answer yeah. to that question would be yes there's no there is no uh language in mgl 87 that differentiates between you know that says that after two years or after six months the the tree will revert to uh private ownership it says uh, specifically that the, the trees covered under section one and section five of MGL 87 are um, to be considered public shade trees. Um, unfortunately, you know, what happens is that every community <clears throat> in Massachusetts interprets MGL 87 or the legal counsel for every community interprets MGL 87 a little differently. We are one of the, f I think we are probably the only community of maybe we're maybe there's another one i don't i don't know for sure i'd have to investigate it that actually files these things at the registry of deeds but everyone else seems to turn it over um you know turn them over to the resident after a period of time um but our go ahead so sorry oh i'm sorry is there any way to revisit that uh you it would uh you sure we could ask alan seawald really i mean i think that's what that amounts to so, the, but one, I, of the, one of the only communities. I'm sorry. Yes, we are one of the only communities in Massachusetts that actually that I'm aware of from the tree, other tree wards that I know and other city foresters that actually file the setback agreements at the Registry of Deeds. Mm -hmm. Because MGL 87 is does not does not say that the trees or shrubs get turned over after a period of time. So Alan Seawald's position has been that with the city doesn't have the right to subvert MGL 87 and make their own regulation, in essence, their own agreement that says the tree gets turned over for two years uh, in two years time. So I just, you know, I, I, just from that perspective, I just want to put that out there that that is a distinct possibility. We will have to continue to do this um, with any kind of. Um, you know, smaller tree planting or um, shrub planting, um, and I and I just also want to say that I think I think this is a, I <clears throat> I I hear what everyone is saying, and I do think it would be interesting to try this as a pilot mm. to see actually how it goes. But I definitely also am uh, hearing uh, what Molly was just uh, talking about the actual benefits of. Um, you know the larger canopy tree versus the smaller, um, the smaller shrub planting, and you know, in re relation to like the urban heat island effect, 
um, and its ability to like absorb storm water and uh, its ability to sequester carbon. Um, you know what I think. I think groups, a, a large grouping of uh, these types of shrubs are understory plantings in conjunction with a with a a nice public shade tree in the vicinity would also would create a nice little area that um, is going to have its own little uh, its own little uh, mi microclimate in essence. It's going to be kind of interesting. So I'm I'm definitely. I think it would be good to try it. I think, but that's that's just me, and I'm one vote. Um, but I think you know we also other things to consider too, is that if we're going to do something like this, we should we have a brochure that specifically talks about setback trees that we need to think about looking at that brochure and deciding if we wanted to actually change that particular brochure or make a whole new brochure, et cetera, things of that nature. So just like some logistical things to think about um I think because if it's, a, if it's a pilot rich i think you could just print off just on a copy machine a, a little you know pilot understory program and just slide it in there rather than reprinting because that's quite that's the project good. okay Wait, did you finish your thought i'm sorry yeah, no, no, this, I'm good. I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to put myself on mute for a minute. Yes, I did. I have a question, Sue. How, how many, how many shrubs, if, if, if we run a pile, how many shrubs do you think is the ideal number to offer people as, as a choice? I don't have an educated guess on that. Um, I think it would be a matter of looking at the sites where examining for plantings mm -hmm. like we're looking at ice pond road which is more street trees but um we'd have to look at it would be kind of site specific i think especially when you're looking at the actual you know what kind of trees are you planting there and then what is the space like and then what would be good complementary understory plantings to create these sort of microclimates any thoughts what were you thinking david well, I'd love to hear Jen's thoughts, but I think it should be a pretty short list so that people aren't overwhelmed with the choice and, and chosen by experts like Jordan and Jen and Rich. Um, are, were you done, David? Um, I, have a, I have a couple of thoughts. I would love to, well, going back to, to the... Uh, setback agreements i would love to have that revisited because i do think it's can be a barrier to people accepting a setback um so and there's you know most courts i mean i'm no lawyer but most courts like look at precedent you know and all over the state there's precedent for not like you know doing the way we do it but anyway that's one thing but the, um, I think one way to choose the, uh, which, like, I, I agree with the short list. I think that's smart. Um, we, you know, potentially we could, uh, we have a neighborhood in Grant Ave that is interested in a neighborhood planting. So we could, you know, try that. We haven't, we talked to them a little bit, but not a lot. There's, there's a lot of room for setback, not a lot of room for, um, you know, uh, public planting like on the, in the tree belts or, um, and there's a neighbor there that's interested in being the point person. So that's just something to throw in the mix. And then also, um, uh, we probably should look at if we have a list of plants, like, can we get them? You know, for example, like nannyberry viburnum, like, I don't, I don't, maybe there's nurseries that are carrying it now, but um, places I've worked, we've had them, but not, um, you know, can we get this plant material that's, you know, in a reasonable size, I guess. We don't want to be planting like one gallon shrubs, you know, so. Um, and they have to be able to, I don't know what the, um, Rich, I don't know what the 
what the parameters are for who we can buy from, who the city can buy from. I don't know if there's approved vendors. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the procurement so, process. So it may be like that might be the one place to start to see like, okay, what is there really there? So Molly. Um well I just want to register that I I don't think that we should be spending a lot of energy on shrubs. I do think the setback program is really important and I I want us to get moving on that. Um but I would say I'm not in favor of, of us including shrubs, unless maybe if it was a place where a tree couldn't go for some reason. But I just don't feel like it's a really good use of our time and money, um, you know, given the, given the relative benefits of trees versus shrubs. Thanks. I mean, what Rich said kind of resonated. I'm imagining like, roundabouts and things, you know, where maybe you put in some trees and then maybe some some other plantings near a path. I don't know. To try to accommodate, you know, trying new things. I'm also a question though, if we if we did do the pilot program, what would be the goals of what we're trying to find out in the pilot program? Well, I, I mean, I think partly you're just trying to gauge demand for mm -hmm. shrubs versus traditional large setback trees. Mm. I would add, um, I'm not sure what the sort of, if is what the driver is, right? I mean, certainly we know that what we think of as trees provide more ecosystem services um, and add add value in, in all the ways that we're all familiar with. Um, if there is, if this is sort of a way to introduce the public to a way to use the setback for planting, for planting woody plants, for planting perhaps things that are not going to reach the canopy size that would be prohibited because of the, the space. Uh, that we're talking about, you know, we, we there are there are trees right that fit that bill. Um, I don't I guess I don't think of it in lieu of um, canopy trees or the types of even understory trees that we think of um, that we typically would plant under wires like crabapple, um, Japanese tree lilac, and what, whatever sort of the the ten typical sort of go to trees that we as urban foresters use for that for that purpose. Um, uh, but something like, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the conversation, but this, the roundabout um, idea is a good one, um, you know, and, be, and as part of urban forestry, of course, we think in terms of plant communities, right? So shrubs form an important part of the plant community. I think it might behoove us to sort of cut it off at anything herbaceous, right? No perennials, we're not talking about like perennials and not sort of even talking ornamental, but we're talking about uh, woody plants that can add structure, that can add value, that can help us make good use um, of spaces that are otherwise unusable um, from a woody plant standpoint. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's value here, but there are certainly unanswered questions, procurement um, being an important one. So that might be a good place to start. Why talk about things that we can't um, source? Um, so there's like an important conversation um, and uh, certainly a trial uh, with um, but the answered question of what are we trying to achieve, I think is, is great and I'm, I'm happy to contribute. One more quick thing to say, uh, I was at a, a conference on Sunday at Berkshire Botanical Garden that um, called Rooted in Place or something. But anyway, what they were talking about is uh, uh, somewhat uh, resilience or wait. Um, anyway, the landscapes that build and give back. And in particular, when David was talking about the native plants, um, you know, to, to, you know, provide native plants that are, you know, caterpillar hosts and bird hosts and um, potential pollinators, you know, some of our plants are wind pollinated and that's not really a pollinator, 
plant. But um, anyway, that could be to your point, Jordan, of, you know, what other services that can we, can we, you know, provide. So. Thanks everybody for contributing. Um, should we backtrack to the, um, let's see. I think we've used the time. Rich Par Parcelletti, are you able to do the chair, the chair tree warden report at this time? We can, we can just keep moving through the agenda. I don't really have a lot to add. Not, not much has happened. Okay. Well, planting. We are on fire. We're planting, planting. <laughs> Jen has been, you know, has really picked up the leadership role in where the rubber meets the road. Where are we planting? What we're planting there? And um, Jen, I think my calculations is we're about 125 this season with about 16 outings. So that's Sunday, Saturdays and Wednesdays. That's counting this coming Saturday. Does that sound about yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. I wrote up a little, um, we're almost probably at the end of the planting season. I'm hoping we can have a couple more plantings. Um, depends on the weather. The, the limiting factor is kind of how cold it gets the night before. We can't really plant frozen root balls, even though they might unfreeze during the day. It, we have to, just because of the way we do it, we loosen them all up and find the root flare and stuff. But um, I kind of compiled the little thing. Uh, should I just go through it? A little sheet? Yeah, there? yeah, please. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. I didn't mean to steal the thunder there. No, no, go. That was totally fine. That was totally fine. Um, so I kind of thought we, I was kind of reflecting back and we kind of had five goals Um when Sue and I agreed to kind of partner to make these plantings happen. And our first goal was emptying the nursery of trees. Some of those trees had been there because of COVID and uh, drought and Rob and Alicia leaving between one, two and three years. So we really needed to move that stuff out of there. So um, we have almost, you know, we're pretty close. We're about as close as you could you know, we have a few, some stuff in there, so, um, but we were pretty close. And then we, our second goal was to clean up and attend to the current setback request list, more recent setback requests. So I feel like we did that. Um, we have so, a, a few that are going to go over into the spring and, you know, we'll get more. Uh, but we done that pretty much. Um, then the third one is to um, complete replanting the dead removed tree list. Uh, Rich Parish and a group of people went around and pulled out uh, trees that were that died for various reasons. Um, we have a pretty high percentage of, of uh, success, so um, compared to the average. But um, we went through that list and uh, repopulated, I think, almost all of the dead list. There might be a few places we needed a different tree that we didn't have. Uh, then the fourth goal was to go through a list that Rich gave me that um, was from uh, spring of 2023 from tree removals that were stumps that got ground. So that involved uh, visiting the site, assessing if it was pro appropriate to be replanted. Sometimes they're not because maybe it was like too close to a driveway anyway, or it wasn't in a, you know, there was a, there was a handful of them that just didn't make sense to replant there. Uh, then we needed to stake and dig safe them that were appropriate and then match a tree from the nursery to that site. So that was part of our like, getting rid of the ones from the nursery. So we we went through that entire list and I think there's only a couple of, on Pleasant Street that were a question of who was really responsible for them that we're trying to figure out. Uh, and then um, the fifth goal was, uh, in my opinion, was to review the tree tracker list that um, Alicia handed to us uh, because of, um, you know, she was moving and Rob left and there was a lot of questions. So we went through line by line and driving around and figuring out all, you know, is this site, some were planted, some weren't, you know, 
So we cleaned up the list, uh, visited the questionable sites or question the sites with not that the sites were questionable, the sites we had questions about. And then we made decisions and actions that needed to be taken. Like, did it need to be dig safe? Just do we replant? Is it a replant? Is, do we take it off the list? So pretty much, I feel really good. We uh, pretty much, you know, 99% of all those things we accomplished fully. Um, so we, so I feel great about the volunteers that stepped up. There's people that helped me. I'd hand lists off and people would go out and look at them or tell me this or see if the stakes were there. And then Sue and I met kind of weekly and some kind of phone calls in between. So uh, I feel great about that. So what I, uh, the data I have, and I don't, uh, we started planting on the 20th of September. We had two dates before that, but it was canceled, one due to heat and one due to rain. Um, I've got so far roughly 110 trees, but you said 120 could be that. I was, I was counting this, this Saturday's 13. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely will be over 120, yeah. So we averaged about seven trees per planting. Um, we're hoping to add 13 trees this Saturday to Bridge Street Cemetery if it's not too bad of weather. Um, and uh, we're using new technology um, that Rich is trying, these tree diapers, which are... Um, we oh, need another it, name for them. <laughs> it's this kind of uh, partial... Donut. donut? Partial donut that we lay right on the mulch, right a thin layer of mulch and then cover it up with a little bit of mulch uh, that has, uh, they're soaked in a bucket of water overnight and it's it's kind of a tarpy mesh on the top and then uh, this white, more fabric-y stuff on the bottom and there's, uh, uh, oh shoot, I can't, uh, it's a, those, a silicon or highly absorbent substance inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it um, collects water. Take, right. That'll take water up from the soil and then release it. And you can leave them for up to three years, I think Rich told me. So we're trying those instead of tree bags. Um, we'll see, you know, we'll see how, how it goes. Um, and then um, we've got on top, on top of the ones uh, that uh, we're hopefully planting this Saturday at Bridge Street Cemetery, we've got about 13 more trees that we are ready to put in the ground if um, you know the weather cooperates. We probably have to wait till after Thanksgiving is the reality. Uh, we've had community partnerships a girl, with the Girl Scouts in particular. They um, helped plant in Bridge Street Cemetery. And um, just general, a general observation is that uh, most planting sites aren't like on one street. Uh, just because we have, um, you know, I group the plantings in region of the city. Um, so the volunteers are separated sometimes in small groups, which has worked out pretty well. Um, I don't think it's the preferred way, but I really think that's going to be what the future of planting is going to be because we don't have whole streets that we have these tree belts that aren't planted because we've been planting since 2016 and Rob did an incredible job populating those. So um, setbacks, I think, um, we'll probably have some neighborhood projects. And then um, I expect to get a takedown list at some point again from um, Rich takedown in the, I think that's going to be where we're primarily planting. So that's just something to think about. Um, I just think it's going to be a trend uh, in the future. And we'll just, you know, I don't, I, my guess is we're not going to be planting the numbers of trees that we planted before. And um, from what I can tell that, uh, you know, the DPW doesn't have the capacity, the staffing capacity, you know, there's short, there's a lot of open positions. So uh, to supply all that. So I think it's totally fine. And uh, I, agree we delivered. I agree with somebody else that said, uh, earlier that the setback program is going to be important. And I think we're going to have a meeting sometime in November to talk about, you know, structure. Oh, and we've had a couple people, volunteers during plantings who have planted with us a lot and some have pruned with us that they want to step up for some type of um, 
leading some one of the tasks that needs to be taken on. So that's uh, that's what I got. That's a really good summary, Jen. And oh, it, um, I'll just add that the it's remarkable that you were able to, you know, look at that inventory that we took in August, which actually changed through mm -hmm. the fall as some trees got, yeah, um, changed too. But, um, and we're able to, with just a minimal ordering of trees, really use the resources we already have so mm -hmm. that those trees all got out there, um, found them spots. So that was real tricky and thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> I'm just curious, um, you said you did plant some setback trees. Where, like about how many of those were there and how did people find out about the setback program? They fill out a form. Was it on the website? What? You go to the Tree Warden website and you um, fill out the setback form. And it's automated, so it goes into a shared spreadsheet. So we can take that information and we put it in our tree tracker. And Christina and Jen and Bob Haxby um, have been following up, you know, going to talk to the person. Am I missing? I hope I'm not missing someone. Talking to them about the, um, the site, the type of tree that would be good there. And then what, you know, we're, we might have available to us or to order. Does that make sense, Molly? Yeah, that's great. Um, a lot of back and forth with this. Yeah, app. that's fantastic. I'm wondering, Jen, you did so much work, you and, and the team who you were working with. Um, I haven't been able to do actual plantings, but I'm wondering if there's some way, are there, now that you've sort of been through a season with it, can you identify certain tasks that, I or other people on the commission could do to lighten your load? Um, yeah, I think um, I think uh, it would probably be more productive. I kind of have um, Rich Parish gave me some job descriptions that some folks got together and, and thought about when they talked to um, Rob and Alicia. And then I kind of had my own ideas about, oh, he, this is a way we need to divide things up. And I kind of started just rough on a piece of paper, like a flow chart kind or a organizational chart or something. Um, so I do think, I mean, kind of the plan was to do a, uh, Rich had some name for it. Uh, what did you call it? Some kind of meeting after it was a wash. What did you call it? A wrap? Oh, the hot wash. Yeah, that's a hot it. wash. Oh, hot wash. And I, don't mean, I don't mean, and I don't mean the laundry. I mean, well, it sort of is like airing out laundry in essence. It's yeah. it's a public safety term that's um that's used after you have a uh, like an emergency event and it's <laughs> over with, and you work through it, then you actually meet uh, whenever it's convenient for everyone to sort of go over everything, like what went well, what didn't go well um what you know uh what could you do uh what could you improve upon you know so it sounds I think like it a, be... a debriefing is that another word for the it is thing? but it is it is but de uh, fun to say hot wash yeah, yeah. i mean sorry <laughs> after, that's, after that's action my, review uh, aar after action yeah that's well okay so right. yes yeah, so in my, in my limited operational capacity uh in my life it's always been a hot wash so jordan thank you for putting an acronym to it though i appreciate it <laughs> there's bar before action review aar you know it's all basically yeah. the same thing yeah so i think i don't want to take up a lot of time in this meeting but i think um certainly we're going to have a broad uh uh, review and anyone, my opinion is anyone who's interested could come. We'll try to set it up at a, at a time people can come. And I just, I just want to get things a little more formalized, like in some way people could look at it, you know. Um, By probably, all means, Molly, there's a role for you. Yeah, for sure. For <laughs> sure. For sure. Especially because sure. you're, you're good with tracking and things like that too. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Thanks. And, We're and definitely 
the a big thing we're definitely going to need some people who are interested in working with people for setbacks like that is not something that what i'm doing now that i'm also going to be able to do you know and if we want to start that with more you know somebody to coordinate that and then a group of people who are willing to talk to to um citizens because the uh coordinator tracker is yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth and um you know it's not a problem getting the trees or getting them dig safe or anything well that's a thing but it's a lot of um, work but it's not as mind yeah you gotta follow up there's a lot right of now, what did they say and uh, yeah. where did i leave off with them and this yeah, person yeah, and that yeah. person and trying to convince them to take a bigger tree than they want yeah. stuff like that <laughs> so anyway um i just want to say jen uh sue Rich Parish. I mean, everyone that's really um, worked very hard this fall to actually make sure that everything, you know, picking up the pieces in essence and actually getting everything planted, getting the nursery cleaned out, dealing with all the lists, having all the meetings on your own, either through phone calls or in person. I just want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because you've, uh, you've made it pretty much seamless. Um, and I also want to thank my crew because I have not been very available on Wednesdays and they have delivered everything. Um, they did have a message, though. Their message was that maybe you could show the volunteers that the donuts that are separate, the diapers, they're supposed to go together. Because Brooke said to me, I went back the other day and the other tree diapers that were fully um, ready to be used are only on one side of the tree. She goes, I'm not really sure what happened. I'm like, I'll mention it. So, <laughs> but. Um, that was, yeah, one of my you know. both, that was one of my crews we sent off and they didn't understand. They were like, they put out two. And I was like, oh, those were halves. And, you know, so now they know, yeah. but I do. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's all, it's all good. They, they, they put it all together, but I also can tell you the crew is ecstatic by the fact that they're not going to have to go put out water bags. I, I so I they're very happy about that because p picking up the water bags this time of year, um, while it may seem mundane, they're actually kind of disgusting because they usually are covered in uh, um, dog dog uh, dog dog stuff. So uh, and they have animals sometimes in them. So um, so they're happy about the fact that they're going to pack them away and put them away, and hopefully um, the tree diaper method will will pan out um so i just want to say thank you very much um one thing i, I did want what to jen mention, said we so appreciate yeah. the deliveries oh my goodness all that stuff oh yeah no i mean it's i mean it's great and again this i wednesday's next uh year will not be like this for me so i'll be more involved uh in the spring one thing i did want to mention though is that i do think um the sooner that we can have a discussion about the spring planting and i know that's months away um i think it would be behoove us um to actually try to secure uh, some nursery stock even if it's just tagging the nursery stock seeing what's available at amherst nursery trying to figure out um what john is going to have available in the spring just because i would like to get ahead of uh, i like to get ahead of the curve because i uh, at our um at the uh, class that I was at today, Julie Coop from DCR was speaking about all the grant funding opportunities that are available. Um, and there's 400 and I don't know, Jordan, $430,000 worth of grant grant monies that are available this year through DCR alone. They're not all for planting, but a lot of them are for planting. And DCR is also increasing their greening of the Gateway Cities program. So they are you know, they basically have a two-year commitment in the communities they work in. They have a, um, you know, targeted goal of a couple thousand trees to be planted in every community, and they just keep moving on. And DCR has the ability to hire more staff, so they actually have the ability to increase their planting program, which puts pressures on the nursery trade. And we all source from the same nursery, um, nurseries, Bigelow, um, you know, um, Bigelow, uh, Amherst Nursery, um, DCR doesn't really do bare root plantings. Um, but again, that's always like a little niche thing that we can do if we have 
So there's a lot of material available through the bare root process, the bare root nurseries, but I don't know when, if, if we want to just chat off offline and email and try to figure out a time to maybe have a discussion just about your thoughts so we can actually um, think about going to Amherst nursery and tagging some trees before we get too much snow. That would be great. Do we do we have like an easy way to kind of like just see maybe the last three years the average numbers of X Y Z trees that we yeah. have you know so I I mean just from what you're talking about right now I mean we have a small idea of some things we need to get to fill holes. Mm -hmm for next spring, but it's it's not a lot. So my gut feeling is we could just kind of get, do what you just said, like how, if we know we always get 10 of this or 15 of that or whatever, we could just go ahead and put it together a list like that. And then if we can have the ability to have more information to, you know, get that list more precise, we can, do that later, but at least we could say this is what we're starting with. Does yeah, that make sense? Small, medium, and large. We'd try to tag um, as many as we could in with a, a good variety of species from what is in the field. In my brief experience doing it, can you speak, Rich? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think so. Yes, so you're absolutely correct, and I think that 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 was the easy way to do it because we sort of had the spaces to back into um, where we don't have the spaces to back into. So I think we're going to have to be a little more uh, site specific when we're selecting um, trees um, to fit a particular space. And we're also going to have to think about our species diversity. That's, I think that's where Jen is probably like thinking about trying to see what we've planted. And, and I do have that spreadsheet available, which would be helpful. Um, because I think as we, the farther we go, the farther we go along, um, as Rob has indi as Rob indicated and others on the commission and other people we've worked with that, you know, we're going to be, uh, it's not a bad thing, but we're running out of easy places to plant. So we have to sort of like back into the places we know we can plant in mass and then get those done like the ice pond drive and the Ridgeview, uh, Ridgeview roads and places where um, village hill area where there's multiples of ash trees that have to be removed. Mm -hmm. And then sort of we have to have a selection of trees that can fit into the other places we've identified. And again, you know, we've done probably 70 removals this year. So there's, you know, potentially, you know, 60 places we can plant trees. Mm -hmm. um probably even more than that maybe 65 so i think just sitting down and sort of looking at all that would be helpful yeah. um so we could do that before so we have an idea of what we want so i i'm you know the beginning of december is a good time for me to meet if anyone has yeah. time and they want to meet i'd be more than happy to yeah i could sort of try you. to okay and anybody right. else so wants yeah. To, yeah yeah so let's just, I'll, I guess I'll, what I'll do is I'll send, I'll send an email to the whole commission. So, our, and then we, I'll just put some dates out there that work. Um, and then we'll go from there. Sounds great. great. We okay. are two minutes behind. All right, Sue, you're lead when the charge. You're pruning. <clears throat> Rich, okay. um, Eric, may yeah. I ask you to. Okay. Uh, of course, pruning of the, the young city trees was historically done by Rich and uh, Jay Gerard, but mainly Rob Postel. Um, and some of, uh, you know, some of us have then acted as, say, assistants and uh, students of those folks. So now we're at the point where uh, where those folks are are not able to take as much of a role as they had before, but say the previous volunteers, myself, Jen, and uh, several others who've gained experience under these experts are now taking on more of the, the role 
of pruning the city trees, the young trees. Um, and this is going to take the form of uh, a crew of us going around the city, uh, working on trees that have not been pruned in the past um, or have not been pruned for a considerable amount of time. So using spreadsheets of the tree list, we're able to say, uh, I, I think we can make a pretty good uh, selection as to which trees need to be done at what time. Now, what we're going to do is uh, we've organized say, a training session for our volunteer pruners that will happen at the end of this month. Uh, there'll be about 10 folks uh, participating in that, you know, several of which have, have uh, some good experience and others that are just kind of coming into the, the activity. And uh, Jay Gerard will be assisting us in that training program. And then from then on, we will try to have say a regular weekly uh, work session out on the, uh, the on the streets working on the trees uh, either with Jay or with some of us more experienced folks kind of mentoring the other ones and this follows along similarly to what we did a year ago and last year we were able to handle about 400 of the city trees. And so this year we'll just see what, uh, you know, what the uh, the manpower and the weather and everything else uh, permits us to do. But, uh, the, ideally the, the young trees should be first pruned at about two to three years after planting. And then again, maybe five or six years after planting. So there'll be a, you know, with 2,000 trees having been planted since 2015, you know, we've got, there's a lot of work to do. And each of these trees will have gone through at least two different prunings. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's a sizable effort, but, uh, and we will do what we're able to do. And I'm, um, so, oh, any other comments from you, Rich? Uh, no, other than um, no, I, I don't really have any comments. I I would have to say that I think that you know we need to get these trees. So, 2015, so 2025, the, ten, the trees will be 10 years old. They should have at least a minimum of two, if not three, structural prunes uh, done to them. But I and I think you know we again I. I would just where Rich and I met. Um, I was last week, Rich. I think we met and we talked uh, about the uh, about the training coming up and a little PowerPoint presentation. And I gave Rich some uh, materials um, and some links to some uh, websites uh, from Ed Gilman, who's a um, urban forestry professor at the University of Florida. Um, and I also actually, Rich, I did bring back this, your best, I don't know if you can see that, but I, this yeah. is yours. I will, I will text you tomorrow and we'll connect and you, I can drop this off or we can connect somewhere. So that was a freebie for mass tree wardens. Um, <clears throat> so no, I mean, I just think, you know, I, I think some of the, some of the tree species that we've planted, we have to remember too, that, you know, the species profiles are all different. So elms may require more pruning. Yeah. Um, you know, every, 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 like this year, the elms grew like 24 inches. I mean, of course, everything grew this year, but I mean, the elms in particular just got, went crazy. And so did all the tulip trees and things of that nature. So I think we're, you're going to be in the lindens, the lindens are grew, uh, exponentially as well. So I think there's a lot of trees that we pruned probably two years ago that we can probably go back and, and do a little maintenance pruning on them. Um, so I, but I, no, I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping to actually um, be able to attend the training and actually go out and do some pruning myself with folks, which would be uh, a boon for me. So maybe someone else would do Tree City USA for me this year. I mean, any takers? 
Okay, I can I can actually raise all your hands at once, actually, because I have the control of this device. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think if yeah, so Rich, you I'll connect with you tomorrow. Okay, and then we'll go from there. Um, and then, um, Rich, have you gotten a good response from that email that you sent out? Regarding the pruning training, has any, anyone responded to that email? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, oh, okay. <clears throat> yes, everybody's pretty much on board. For... Okay. Did you send that out to us? No, this is to the, the volunteer pruners. Ah, okay. Who will be participating and assisting. I wouldn't mind learning how to do that. And helping out with pruning too, something like really hands-on and practical. Okay. You know, it, at some point, uh, you know, we've got a, a kind of a one of our goals in all this was to generate a a core group of volunteers, you know, in the city that can handle this, you know, going on into the future. Um, and a lot of it involves, you know, going out to the the tree sites with the either with say an arborist like Jay Gerard or the more experienced people, you know, and talking about the tree, doing the work. Um, and, but at some point, you know, a large group can become uh, maybe a little less manageable to handle. You know, if you have a dozen people crowded around a tree, uh, so I'm I'm hesitant to open it up to the the general public. For this, you know, we we want to. Uh, in the past, we've had kind of the the experienced planters also go on into the pruning. But certainly, at the very least, attending the training session, you know that, yeah, that that's uh, and you there could be a lot of good information you'll see there. So I'll send you that link, Molly. Thank you. Okay. I'll chime in and say, Rich, thanks for stepping up with the leadership, Rich Parrish, to mm -hmm. as a volunteer, um, putting the pieces, the key elements, date for training, place for training, communication. Thank you. Um, where are we? Five thirty-one. Spotted lantern fly. Molly, do you want to? Yeah. Um, well, what's happened since the last meeting is that Rich has put the letter on to letterhead. And I I squished it down so it fits onto one page. It's I basically got rid of the spaces between the paragraphs. And um, I left out one line about what DCR would likely do the follow-up if um if any spotted lantern flies were found and i think all of you should have received an email that had that um that letter had letter in it and so all we have to do is approve the letter so it can go to get approved by the mayor so then it can get finally sent out do people want to look at it again or um, wasn't there two versions in the in the email hmm. what were the two versions there, I sent, email. I, yeah i sent along a version your version and then i sent along a version that jen and sue had oh, done in the, oh. my most recent email um along with right. um another document that i can't remember at the moment boy i'm terrible oh, okay. i'm sorry I well, didn't see that one. It was with everything. It was the agenda and the yeah. It was today. Yeah, thank it you. Was the minutes the, draft minutes. Yeah, the yeah. minutes, the agenda, and yep. those two. I and I was confused what the two were, but now I understand. Yeah. What one is the one is the draft that uh, Molly uh, uh, worked on? The other one was a draft that Jen and Sue worked on, and I wanted all of you to both see see them both because they were sent. They were worked on by commissioners and sent to uh, sent to me, and then I put them as with the package. So we, you as a commission, can decide which okay. letter um, you would like to use, or a combination of the two. Or I just want to make sure that we're all in agreement um, about what gets sent uh, to the mayor's office beforehand. 
I I have the both of the letters pulled up on my screen right now. If if we want to do a screen share, we could look at them side by side. Sure, Bonnie, could you make uh, Molly a co-host, please? I'm still getting the no can do message. Hold on a second. Let me uh let me see if I can Yeah, I it. can't do it, Rich. I don't have that option. Oh, oh really? Okay. All right, hold on. Let me see if uh, I think only the host or the co-host can or maybe just even the host. Um, Are you the host right. too? I Where's just made yeah. I just made I just made you the a co-host. Got it. Okay. Works. I can do it now. Okay. Um, thank, thank you anyways Bonnie I don't know why that doesn't work my, my apologies here we go all right can you see the two letters side by side no we only I only see one. Oh, I, I see, see one. I see I see what the issue is never mind I know what to do I know what to do uh, okay hold on uh Oh, interesting. Um, there's a like a frame around one. Uh, I don't know how to undo that. Um, there's a frame around one of the things. Maybe what I'll do is. Oh, how can I show them? Molly, do you have a Mac? No, I have a, a PC. PC. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there's a way that you pull it. I never yeah, was very successful. At, like you pull it over to the side, and then it'll make them side by side. I have on my screen. I have the two letters side by side, but mm. one of them has a green frame around it, which is a zoom feature. Where oh. you, when you want to just see part of the. Wait, I'm going to stop the share and see if there's a different way to do this. Let's see. Basic. Maybe it just won't let me do like because there's basically I have like two screens visible at once. Let me try this one. Now it's put the green around the other one. Yeah, it doesn't like when I have two screens like side by side. It won't let me show both of them at once. So that idea doesn't work. Um, but what are the differences? Let's see. So now you're looking at the one that Jen and Sue did. Um, and it's the differences. Um, we were capitalizing spotted lantern fly. Oh, okay. Uh, does tree of heaven, does heaven need capitalization? Mm. Yes. It's the proper name. Okay. Change some of the sentence structures <laughs> to be a, more direct and, um, tried to take out anything we thought we could do without so that it was easier to read, like quicker to mm -hmm. read. Yeah, that's great. I just don't have, I can't like at my fingertips see what the things are that changed. Um, do you know offhand what the things were that you took out? So. Um, what, what, one of the things that I did after I got the letter is that uh, Molly, if you scroll down on the bottom, cause I, we, I can't see the bottom. So um, if you find any signs of uh, uh, SLF, uh, please immediately report to the Mass Department of Agriculture, MDAR here. That, yeah. that was reiterated at the, um, in the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. So I just, instead of having it in there twice in order to fit this version on one, uh, one uh, side of a, uh, the document, I took, it, I took the first one out and just basically, you know, at the end of the letter, if you find spot mm -hmm. or lantern fly, mm -hmm. please be reported to blah, 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 blah. So and that made okay. it. And then I just pulled up the bullet points. So in, um, instead of them being uh, double spaced, they're single spaced and collapsed it a little bit. That's really about all I did. 
Well, it looks fun. I think we should just go ahead and let's just do it. Let's get this out there. Okay. Oh, uh, should I stop sharing now? Yeah, I just see a couple capitalizations. That's all. Uh, Sue, you could you could you can edit that because I sent it to you in a Word doc. If you want to send it back to me, that's fine. Okay. If, if if everyone in the commission's okay with that letter being sent, is everyone okay with that using that? Okay. All right. We didn't add anything. We just tried to subtract so it could be bigger font and one page to make it easier. Good, great. So what's involved in um well hopefully the mayor can have a quick turnaround on it and then Rich, are you okay with doing the addressing and all that stuff? Okay. Yeah, I can I, I, yes, I can handle that. Yep. Right. That'll be good to get that out there. It's either addressing it or depending upon how they might just drop it off as a hand letter. Mm -hmm. That's another way of doing it. So I think Bonnie said she wanted to get out of the office. So we could, we, we, could, do it. we could, <laughs> could do a little delivery day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're done with that topic, Sue. Okay. Then we are on to any other business not anticipated by the chair. Oh, Jen's hands up. Uh, I just have a quick thing. I attended the today the quarterly um, update for um, Spotted Lanternfly. Mm. Uh, MDAR does, does these things quarterly and I just want to um, say there were just a couple highlights they had a um, a speaker from Penn State um, who deals with uh, uh, grapes is her specialty and that's really the number one problem right oh. now they're just finding that um, other fruit crops they'll go to it but it's not a huge problem and um, it but it is a pretty big problem for for wineries and we don't need to go into the into that stuff but the other thing is they um talked about um the last update was august and there was four infestations in the state of massachusetts there are now a total of 10 so there was uh six more and uh, a couple of them are pretty small and these were all reported by citizens and then they go out and look for them um and there's one in holyoke which um and Agawam are the two that are closest to us mm -hmm. um they're all related to businesses or uh heavy transportation corridors or you know truck and that's really what they're thinking is that's the way it's really primarily being spread um and um they are basically um what I can get from it is that they are um actively monitoring these sites and doing different types of treatments with the idea to mitigate them expanding. And they also have a team of people that go out and look at the reports. So, um, and they have a much better idea of like um, how it spreads, when it spreads, that kind of thing. Um, and that really, um, Oh, and the one we were curious about controlling Alanthus, and they said it's not really worth like cutting down Alanthus because um, they will go to other things. Mm. They do love Alanthus, but um, um, that uh, also if you remove the tree, it's going to sucker, and those suckers they really love. Mm. So it's an would be an mm. ongoing thing. So. Um, uh, and the USDA is currently doing research on some biological controls, but that's going to be um, down the road. So they are definitely um, doing systemic treatments and um, uh, and they found that um, on certain trees, they'll they'll go in there, but they won't stay like apples and stuff like that, where grapes, they are in there and they're there for the duration. That's their favorite and the Atlantis, but they don't need Atlantis to be able to do their thing. So are they doing anything with trap trees? 
Uh, they didn't talk about that. They're do, they're using traps, different types. There's two different types of traps, one for the nymphs and one for the adults. Um, uh, to kind of um, uh, do a little bit of mitigation, but also to try to monitor what's going on. So, yeah, that that's the basics. So, thank you for that information. Yeah, yeah sure. Um. Sue, I just wanted to, can, can we just circle back? We have a little bit of time. Can we just circle back to um, the incorporating native shrubs into the setback mix? I just, I wanted to, um, we kind of left it like open-ended in essence. I, I guess what, what is, is the commission interested in actually doing a little, um, you know, having like a, like a sub uh, subcommittee type meeting or, are we wanting folks that are wanting to spearhead this, like Jordan and David sort of work independently? Um, we sort of didn't really like leave the, that part of the meeting or that uh, agenda item with any specific um, specific work needed to be done. I wasn't sure what, what people, you know, what folks would like to do. Um, Sorry about that. Um, no, 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 it's, it's, it's fine. I just, I don't. I think we I, talked about it um, at a prior meeting. The idea that there's a lot going on with the planting right now, but by all means, you know, we want to chime in on some action points there. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of. Uh, I'm happy to work with David on uh, next steps. Um, I think I need a little more background as to. Um, what exactly we're trying to achieve is is it a pilot just to sort of edu educate the public is it a pilot uh because it's something perhaps if it's successful along with other inputs is, is a direction that or that the city might want to take uh, in terms of addressing uh planting on setbacks and or private property and setbacks so I'm, once i sort of understand we can parse this out a little bit more about what the in fact the goals are if we want to uh you know go forward with this concept and then it'll be easier to sort of work toward those goals. Have we agreed as a commission that it's something that we want to pursue? Is it is it enough of a priority? Do enough people in the commission feel like it's a priority, you know, to go ahead and do at least a pilot? I, I would vote no, but I don't know how the rest of you feel. You know, I'll say this as someone who sort of is in the urban forestry space in 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 Hartford, right, at, at present, but and been in other places too. You know, the focus typically is uh, canopy, right? Let's just be clear. When we have a mandate to increase canopy, uh, it's it's critical for all the reasons, um, you know, not the least of which are are uh, you know the climate crisis, and there's funds available for it, right? So let's get on it and use the money that we we sort of that's out there, that is clearly out there, that again, as Rich pointed out, was, was um, for, at least from a state level, there's money coming from the feds through the states to local communities to increase canopy, among other things. So, you know, this could be sort of, as I said, an interesting project to educate the public, um, but I'd be interested in hearing other folks uh, sort of take on whether or not this is more than that. Is it a priority? Is it a direction that could, help us build out plant communities and um, sort of fall under the mandate. For me, I always kind of go back to like, what are we charged with? What is the mandate, you know, of this commission? Um, and, and where does the money sort of take us? So I'd be interested in learning more. <clears throat> yeah, just I'm kind of a, the same mind as Molly on this in that I'm afraid that this work may detract from our efforts in in doing the larger trees uh, perhaps at such time as we have just exhausted locations and such for uh, for the larger shade trees then this may be a logical follow-up uh, to get more uh, foliage in the city but uh, and I'm thinking of it also in an operational sense of Perhaps you have to source these from different locations so that compounds the work of getting the trees. Uh, and then in the pruning world, if the city is responsible for these, 
you know, smaller shrubs, if it's to be done correctly, may need uh, require a lot of extra attention, which detracts from us taking care of the of the main canopy. So, I think operational problems, you know, could be a challenge, and uh, and of course. Any foliage is good, but I don't want to take any of the effort away from the key thing of uh, of the larger trees. I uh, that I well said, Rich and Molly. Um, you know, one of the examples that I can think of it's not it's not a setback planting, but Bridge Street Cemetery, which is not a setback location. It's a you know city owned municipal cemetery. We have started to plant um, uh, some smaller um, woody plant material. Actually, we're working with Paige Bridgens, who lives down the street, and we've planted small, um, uh, like June berries and other uh, smaller plant material as understory plant material there, um, sort of to sort of kind of supplement the um, the overstory that's there. So, I mean, I, I think there's definitely um i think there's definitely places we could do these types of plantings i think the question remains to be seen whether we if the thing that i'm concerned about is i'm not so concerned about sourcing the material i think we could find the material what i'm more concerned about is the the end where we would actually do the maintenance of this material you know this plant material might become and again if we just if we're just doing um if we're doing these kind of plantings on city property that are not setback planting that a complement um, maybe a, a, a large canopy tree that's in the distance, or if, or if you work in conjunction with a large canopy tree that's in the tree belt and you have a setback location that you could plant a small area that has multiple um, understory plants there, uh, not perennials, obviously woody ornamentals then I think that would be fine. But then again, I just go back to like, what is the maintenance responsibility? So, it, so for example, if the plant material, if we have to maintain the setbacks, just like we do setback trees, the plant material dies, then we will end up having to go back and replant it. Or we, if it's successful and it grows, then we have to mix it into our routine pruning cycles. You know, do we have the uh, the volunteer bandwidth to actually make sure these things are pruned correctly, you know? So, I mean, I'm not adverse to, to like trying to answer all of those questions and then come back and have a conversation with the commission, um, you know, I, and, and uh, with all of you to try to figure out if this is something that we could, it could be something that's like in our back pocket that we could offer people if we, if we have resistance to, planting a large setback tree but i think if we were to do <clears throat> a lot of them uh, down the road that we would end up actually struggling to maintain them correctly if we have to maintain them that's what i'm concerned about right now funding for tree uh trees and woody plant material is not a problem that doesn't mean that in the future it's not going to be a problem i, I also want to say that the other thing we have to think about is like main street for main street redesign is going to incorporate a lot of um woody plant material um in these different um understory beds that are going to be all over the place too so i mean again it's it would be uh, from my perspective be interesting to uh, gain some more knowledge about these understory plantings how they work with other larger shade trees in this you know and the kind of ecosystem uh, services they will be giving in conjunction with a shade tree. But again, I think it's really about capacity. That's the only thing I worry about is capacity and setting someone up in the future um, that won't be able to manage them correctly. Um, I'll add in that um, there's the sections on King Street, like across from Dunkin' Donuts, where um, as part of the redesign, mm -hmm. they planted a number of different perennials and shrubs. And um, I went out with some people from Friends of Northampton Trails to try to do a little maintenance on them. And it was, you know, it's it's a lot to take on. I mean, they kind of stepped up to 
beautify it because it was looking looking ragged but um what resonated with me with what jordan said is maybe we should i think it was jordan who said maybe and what rich said put it in the back pocket if we find a site that we think hey remember that idea with the shrubs this would be good spot or if we have a you know specific location but maybe put it to the side for now and focus on our canopy I would support that, you know, and sort of maybe the where this started might predate my my work here. But um, so, you know, I was always eager to jump on and help build on a plant list. Perhaps the value of this, even just talking about it, is just sort of, you know, there could be a takeaway incorporating some of the ideas. Right. I mean, more natives, more diversity in the understory trees that we we do plant, whether it's under whatever power lines or places that are somewhat confined. So maybe we, you know, think about more, you mentioned service berry, uh, Rich, you know, more in the Amelanchier group. I know we can get single stems that will do well under uh, under the power lines, uh, whatever, but things you're already doing, right? Red bud and, um, you know, other types of native and non-native. So maybe there are some learnings to be taken from this idea, but if we are in fact tasked with, um, you know, Increasing canopy and uh, and shade and all the benefits therein. Um, maybe there's something to be to be taken that we can incorporate with the work that is sort of top of mind and top of dollar. Um, and as you said, back pocket or at a later time. Um, yeah. I, I think it would be I think it would be good to Jordan maybe to maybe you could speak with David to identify some plant material that. Um, that you would that would be help be useful to have in that back pocket and maybe yeah, that's where we start at this point and then bring that back to the commission mm -hmm. you know uh the tree list and planting guidelines does have some understory plant material mm -hmm. there but there might be other things that we would like to add to it so i uh, i would i look forward to learning a little more about that if you, if you wouldn't mind at least yeah, from my perspective Sure. So what, is that the existing list? Sorry, Jen. Um, is that the existing list that's on the uh, commission yeah. website? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. We we'll certainly add to that and um, go from there. Thanks. Jordan. Yeah. Just a little, just a quick little context. Um, we did a planting in on, um, on Locust Street in front of Cooley Dickinson Hospital. And um, that was kind of the idea of that. Molly, I think you and I worked on that with the, with the, um, so we had some big trees that mm -hmm. are these big oaks and some other, and we did, we do have clumps of, uh, of Amelanchier underneath those. So that was the one, mm -hmm. but that site was, you know, well off the sidewalk, you know, it was, it was a good site to do that with. It was kind of like a forest inspired design. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I did try uh, at one of the schools at uh, uh, at Leeds School to put in a um, Carolina Silverbell, which we have zero of, and that's just a plant that's a really great plant. And um, but it's you know it's not street; you can't put it on the street, you know. So that's you know you know what I mean. It won't survive. So there are uh, some in Hartford that well-intentioned folks did trials of. And it's, yeah, no, to your point. They're wrong. <laughs> All right. So anyway, but that could be a setback planting. You know, that is a native. That's kind of a climate change tree because it's a little far, you know. So that may be one we we should try to, and we can get that one. I, I know we can get that. So. Hi, right, we're coming up on six. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I noticed I was on Meadow Street today walking down towards the community garden and there's that big sycamore on the right that in front of that historic house, not like right before you cross the bridge. And I noticed that there was, um, the sidewalk was, it looked like it was flexi pave. And I was just curious, um, did we put in, like replace the sidewalk there for the sake of the roots of the trees? And, and also there was another planting of a young tree up closer to Lily Library 
that also had flexi pave on the um, sidewalk. I was just curious about that. Yeah, that, that was part of the, when um, we had, when they redesigned, not redesigned, or repaved Metal Street, um, they did a complete construction of it. And those areas that you're talking about were identified um, as uh, places where no excavation zone. Hmm. So what they ended up doing is they removed the existing blacktop and they replaced it with uh, the uh, proper amount of subgrade material. Uh, oh. Did some air spading, put some TRG, and then actually rolled out the porous uh, the porous pavement in those locations. So that's the tree great. roots weren't disturbed. That's great. I yeah, think pretty... if, if we can do more of that on some of our, you know, <clears throat> like, um, it's great planting all these new young trees, but we really, even better is to maintain the big trees that we have. So if there's any way to um, do more of that kind of stuff, you know, where there's a big tree that's being hindered by pavement. If we can do more of that kind of thing, it would be fantastic. Well, that's a great point. Um, my battery is almost dead. So I can hear. <laughs> run. Time to end the meeting. <laughs> if I disappear, that's all. I move to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. All, all in favor? Hi. Thank you everyone very, very much.